Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the final week of physical science. I just want to start out by saying what an honor and privilege it has been to be with you these last six weeks. Thank you for tuning in to learn physical science each week. Um, so let's just dive right into what we're doing today. Again, we're going to be on our final standard and that is design and conduct investigations to verify the law of conservation of energy, including transformation of potential energy, kinetic energy, thermal, and the effect of any work performed by or on the system. So last week we basically covered the majority of the standard. We covered energy types, we covered law of conservation of energy, and then we introduced work. So um, again, the law of conservation of energy it basically just states that energy cannot be created nor can it be destroyed. It can only be transferred from one type to another. All right, one of the examples we talked about last week was the sun. All right, we had helium and hydrogen atoms burning nuclear energy in the sun. That nuclear energy is transferred to heat energy and radiant energy. That radiant energy is why the earth gets light from the sun. It's why gamma rays and x-rays and radio waves and microwaves travel to the earth and also those visible light rays. All right, so we also talked about um, mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is the sum of all kinetic and potential energy. So kinetic energy is energy in motion. All right, energy in motion. That's rolling across the table, this ping pong ball just fell and bounced back up. That is kinetic energy. Well, potential energy is stored energy based on an object's position. So we said that if you hold this ping pong ball up in the air, then it has stored energy. The reason it has that stored potential energy is that it has the capability of transferring or the capability of turning into kinetic energy. Well. If I set this ping pong ball on the table and I don't touch it, it's never gonna move unless a gust of wind or one of those unbalanced forces come and make it move across the table. So it doesn't have potential energy. It has no potential to start moving on its own. However, what if I took these rubber bands and I just pulled this ping pong ball this way does it now have the potential to start moving? What if I release the ping pong ball? It started moving. That is called elastic potential energy based on position. The further you stretch this rubber band back, the more potential energy it's gonna have. All right, the further you stretch it back, the more potential energy it's gonna have. That is That can be done on a spring, on anything elastic, okay? So basically potential energy is due to gravity or due to the elasticity on a spring, rubber band, um, something of that nature. So we then had an intro to work. Work was the amount of force done on, put on an object to make it travel a certain distance that distance had to be in the direction of that force. So if I took this ball and I pushed it across the table, then that is in the direction of the force. However, if I'm holding this ball up, the force of my hand on the ball is going in the upward direction. But if I start walking this way, then um, am I doing work now? No, I'm not. All right, so I'm doing work this way because the ball is traveling in the direction of the force. However, right now, the ball is not traveling in the direction of the force, so therefore, I'm not doing any work. All right, so we said that the law of conservation of energy, again, was energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transferred from one to another. Work is... Um, the amount of force times the distance of an object. So the amount of force you put on an object over a certain distance that is parallel to that force. Um, joule is the 
unit. Joule is the unit of energy and of work. All right, energy is the ability to do work or the ability to cause change. So I'm causing a change in the position of this ball. That is energy. Work also has joule for its units, okay? The Newton meter, force times distance. Newton is force, um, meter is distance, so a Newton meter equals one joule. Um, <clears throat> how we get that is we have work equals force times distance, all right? Work equals force times distance. Work is joules. Force is measured in newtons, and then um, distance is measured in meters. So a joule is essentially a newton meter. And I'm gonna take it just a little step further, and this may be important for something you're going to um, have a chance in participating in in this lesson today. Force, remember, equals mass times acceleration, where force is a newton, mass is a kilogram, and acceleration is meters per second squared. All right, just remember that. You may be able to participate in something very soon. All right, so kinetic energy was that moving energy. Potential energy was that energy that has the potential to move. And then thermal energy we talked about was heat energy. Again, so if you take your hands and rub them together, that's causing friction. Eventually, all friction causes heat. So you should be feeling your hands warm up by now. Um, all right, so today, that was our little review. Today, we're going to... Um, we just reviewed the law of conservation of energy. If we have time, we'll come back to that, but we're gonna scoot on for now. We're gonna talk about work just a little bit more, simple machines, and power. Today's terms, if you wanna go ahead and jot those down, if you can while I'm talking this fast, is power, watt, efficiency, simple machine, and then we have our six simple machines which, right here, which is a lever, a pulley, a wheel, an axle, an inclined plane, a wedge, and a screw. All right. So um, last week we did number one. Number one was our practice problem. And it said Amy uses 20 newtons of force to push a lawnmower 10 meters. How much work did she do? Well, we used our formula, work equals force times distance, and we found out that she did 200 joules of work. Again, if you want to know this little shortcut, work equals force times distance, you can use this, so if you want to find work, just cover up that W, force times distance. If you want to find distance, work divided by force, and same thing if you want to find force. So number two right here on the board, we're going to do number two and three real quick. Um, how much work does an elephant do while moving a circus wagon 20 meters with a pulling force of 200 newtons? Well, let's just write what we have. We want to find the work. We have a force of 200 newtons and it travels 20 meters. Well, if we wanna find work, force times distance. So two times two is four and then carry your zeros. So the work is 4,000 joules of work. All right, simple as that. Um, number three, it says, Angela uses a force of 25 newtons to lift her grocery bag while doing 50 joules of work. How far did she lift the grocery bag? All right, so now again, just write down what you have. So our work is 50 joules equals 25 newtons. And what we're looking for is our distance. How far did she lift those grocery bags? So if we're looking for distance, just cover up your D right here on your um, pyramid, and we have work divided by force. So just divide by the force, 
and we have um, distance equals two meters. Distance equals two meters, all right? It's as simple as that. These are very simple problems, but if you can master the simple problems, then it can take you into the next step of solving bigger problems. Um, so, let me take you Here we go. Sorry about that, I had trouble with my clicker. So, um, we talked about last week some scenarios of work. All right, last week we talked about that work had to be in the direction of the force. So if I'm holding this clicker up like this, the force is going up, so now when I start walking this way, there's no work being done. It has to go up and down in the direction of the force, parallel to the direction of the force. So we talked about that work wasn't, work in science isn't necessarily what we call work in real life. So look at these five scenarios real quick. A scientist delivers a speech to an audience of his peers. So scientifically, is this science scientist doing work? No, he's not because he is not putting a force and moving something in a direction. A bodybuilder lifts 350 pounds over his head. Is he doing work? Well, he's lifting upward and the weight is going upwards, so he is doing work. A mother carries her baby from room to room, holding the baby up, walking from room to room. No work is being done because the force and the distance are perpendicular to each other, not parallel. A father pushes a baby in a carriage. Well, the distance is going in the same direction of a force, so yes, that would be work. And a woman carries a 20 kilogram grocery bag to her car. Again, force is going up. Direction is not parallel. So no, yes, no, yes, no, all right? So the history of work. Um, so. A long time ago, a long time ago, believe it or not, we didn't have any machines to do our work for us. So people had to become inventive. They might have used animals or come up with some other clever way to do work easier or faster because it could wear on your body, okay? So what they did was they invented simple machines. Um, simple machines have been used since ancient times. Um, the pyramids, the Egyptians must have used some types of simple machines. If you look at um, accounts and, and history, um, pulleys may have been used, inclined planes may have been used. Um, Stonehenge, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Stonehenge, but those are some massive stones, okay? People could not have moved those or place those on top of each other without the help of simple machines. So simple machines have been used for hundreds of years, okay? They're still being used today. We just keep using these simple machines to um, take technology steps up at a time, okay? So um, the one thing simple machines help us do is make the power more efficient. So Power relates to work because power is work divided by time. So it's the amount of work you can do in a period of time. So if you had to load all these boxes into a huge truck, and it's just so hard for you to get those boxes into that truck, guess what? We could use a pulley to lift those up. We could use an incline plane to push those up to do more work in a smaller amount of time. So let's just say we do 500 joules of work, 500 joules of work, and it takes us about five seconds to do it. 
We do 500 joules of work. So we could be pushing an object, we could be lifting an object, doing something. We do 500 joules of work in five seconds. So power equals work divided by time. And our units are watts. All we have to do is take our work, 500 divided by five, we just did 100 watts of work. Now, 100 watts, that should sound familiar to you. What do we see around the house every day that might say 60 watts, 100 watts, something like that on it? And if you're thinking about a light bulb, you are 100% correct. What that means is a light bulb that is 100 watts puts out 100 joules of work or energy in one second. 100 joules of work or energy in one second will give us 100 watts, all right? So now I said you would have a chance to participate in something today. You see a question on the board. How much power will it take to move a 10 kilogram mass at an acceleration of two meters per second squared, a distance of 10 meters in five seconds? All right, so we wanna take a 10 kilogram mass and we wanna accelerate it at two meters per second squared for a distance of 10 meters, but we wanna do it in five seconds. Now, if you can calculate the amount of power that is taking place, if you can calculate the amount of power taking place and email this email right here, mcpsstv at mcpss.com, there will be a Chick-fil-A gift card with your name on it coming straight to you, okay? So I want you to answer that question and email this. If you do not have internet at home, get your cell phone out and send a text message to this email address. All right, mcpsstv at mcpss.com. We're not going to go over this question right now. So if you email and get it correct before the end of today when we go over that, then you will get your Chick-fil-A gift card, okay? So <clears throat> horsepower. Power goes with horsepower. One horsepower equals 746 watts. Where did that come from, horsepower? Well, James Watt, James Watt, the watt is the unit of power. James Watt compa compared the performance of steam engines to that designed um, of the power of horses. So he said that one horse produced 746 watts of power, okay? so. When you see these um, car commercials, 600 horsepower. Well, 600 horsepower times 746, that's the amount of power, the amount of watts that those cars are producing. All right, we're briefly gonna talk about simple machines. We're not gonna get into these, but I just wanna show you kind of what they are, what they do, and um, how they're useful. So a simple machine is a device that helps make work easier. Basically, there you go. It helps make work easier. And it does one of four things. If you look up here on the board, one of the things is transferring a force from one place to the other. So you may not have the force directly on that object. It may be transferring. Changing the direction of the force. So a simple machine could change the direction. Increase the magnitude of force or increase the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would I want to walk 50 feet when I could walk 10 feet? Well, if you can't pick an object up, then you might want to walk 50 instead of 10, okay? So the first one is a lever. Now, um, here are three types of levers, a first class, second class, and third class lever. So if anyone has ever been to a park and been on a seesaw, one person sits on one end and one person sits on the other, and you go up and down and up and down. Well, that's a lever, a first class lever, because you have something in the middle making you teeter, and then you have a load and a resistance. All right, when that fulcrum, that thing that makes you teeter, that fulcrum is in the middle between a load and a resistance, that's a first class lever. A second class lever is something like a wheelbarrow. 
The fulcrum is the wheel. You pick it up on the wheel, you're the resistance, and the load is in the middle. So first class, the fulcrum was in the middle. Second class, the load is in the middle. And then the third class, the resistance will be in the middle. That's what you push or what you hold. So a stapler, you, it's connected to a fulcrum, and then it has the load on one end, the part that emits the staple, and then you push in the middle, your resistance. So first class, the fulcrum is in the middle. Second class, the load is in the middle. And then third class, the resistance is in the middle. Wheel and axle, my favorite simple machine of all time. What does this look like? This looks like the axle of your car or axle of a car that you have ridden in. Why is this such a wonderful, wonderful machine? Well, a wheel and axle is a small axle or a smaller wheel, actually, it turns connected to a large wheel. When you connect that small wheel or that axle into a larger wheel, one complete rotation of this small axle is a complete rotation of the huge wheel. So if you can use a little energy to turn this axle hundreds of times, guess what you're doing? You're using small amounts of energy to turn this huge wheel hundreds of times. So that's why motors and engines in your car, that's the science behind it. That's the technology behind it. All they have to do is turn this tiny little axle to make this big wheel go, okay? There's hundreds of other things this works on, but for time's sake, we're moving on. A pulley. So <clears throat> we talked about, we, I don't know, we hadn't really talked about it, but we talked about it can change direction. So let's say this is a heavy mass. I can barely pick it up. What we can do is this will be my pulley for the day. We can take a pulley, tie a rope to it with your mass, and instead of lifting up, guess what I get to do? I get to pull down. Now, it's a lot easier when you have a large object to be able to pull instead of lift or push. All right, so that's a pulley for you. The more pulleys you have, the less force you actually have to use. Why? You're doing the same amount of work but you use less force with a longer rope. So if you have longer distance, shorter force, same amount of work, okay? An incline plane is a ramp, okay? It's a ramp. You can push it up. Have you ever tried to walk up a, upstairs compared to walking up a ramp? It's just easier. So if you can't get something way high up, just put a little incline plane in there and then uh, walk it up, okay? Well, here's a picture. Incline plane. A wedge, so a wedge is just a modified incline plane. It's used to separate things or hold things. So if you've ever seen a little wedge in a door holding it open, there you go, it's a simple machine at work. If you've ever seen an ax splitting wood, that wedge on that wooden stick, that's a wedge, okay? And it splits the wood. That's a simple machine. Try doing that by hand and tell me if you have any luck. And then the last one is a screw. This is also a modified version of the incline plane. It's just a cylinder with an incline plane wrapped around, and it uses less force to go through a longer distance in construction. All right, that's, that's what it does. Efficiency. Now, this is a blank slide because I just want to talk about efficiency instead of you writing down stuff. So, um, when you do work using simple machines, there's a science behind it that the input force times the distance equals the output force times the distance. If you had a simple machine that is 100% proficient, then you would be able to get stuff done so fast. Why, though, do you think that um, simple machines aren't 100% efficient? Well, look at this. What happens? Every simple machine that you use is going to be touching another surface. That is caused, that causes heat. So you lose energy, you don't lose it, but it's transferred to another form, so that means some of that energy isn't going to be doing what you want it to be doing. So um, here is just kind of a brief look at the Chick-fil-A card, you could have won if you did it. You had to take your mass and acceleration, convert it into 20 newtons of force, then take that force, multiply it by the distance of 10 to get 200 joules, 
and then 200 divided by five would be 40. All right, guys, I have enjoyed these last six weeks with you. I really hope you have learned something. I really hope you can take something of what we've talked about the past six weeks onto the next level. Um, I hope you enjoy your summers. I hope you have been successful with the online platform. This is Mr. Parkin, signing out.